What's up, Ken? Good morning, church. I see we still have a lot of people filtering in through the back. Have everyone come in and grab a seat. But don't sit. Go ahead and stand. Everyone stand on up. We're going to open our worship this morning with a song before we get into our youth worship. So everyone stand. And let's worship together. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth. From the depths of the sea, let all creation praise his name. From the ends of the earth, and from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise his name. Come on, church. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. So shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah Woo! unto the Lord. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everyone's morning? Good. Yes, it's such an awesome day. Isn't it an awesome day? Yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful outside. Did you guys get to play outside yesterday? Yeah. Yes. Are you planning on playing outside today? Yes, yes, me too. I'm planning on playing outside today. It's going to be so much fun. Hey, you need to know. Listen. You're going to play outside with your favorite toys? Yeah, that's going to be sweet. I'm going to play outside with my favorite toys too. They're called DeWalt and Cobalt. It's going to be awesome. Hey, so uh, today, today is a really special day. And this is important. Today is... Anna's birthday. Yeah, yeah. Anna, can you raise your hand? Can you raise your hand? Yeah, right there. It's Anna's birthday. Let's sing happy birthday to Anna. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Anna. Happy birthday to you. Oh, so cool, yeah. Anna's, Anna's 17, right? 17? No? How old are you? Seven. That's right, seven, seven. Hey, quick question. Do you have a birthday? You, you have a birthday? Do you, uh, Aiden, do you have a birthday? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Jace, Jace, do you have a birthday? Yeah, you have a birthday? Kensington, you have a birthday? You even have a birthday. Everybody has a birthday. It's so cool. And, and here's, here's the point, guys, that I want to I drive home today. Because birthdays are really special days. Your mom and your dad, your aunts and your uncles, your grandpa and your grandma, they all celebrate your birth. But before your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa even thought about you, 
there was a God in heaven who said that you were special. Before your mom and dad started praying about you, there was a God in heaven who loved you. And here's, here's what I want you to catch. Whether it's your birthday or not today, God has a great plan for your life. He wants to work in your life. He loves you. Uh, this is going to be like mind-blowing. Ready for this? God who created everything. The hippos, the rhinos, the giraffes, the world, the sky. He, yeah, all of that stuff. He loves you. Here's what scripture says. According to Jesus, he says this. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. Jesus came for you. So we're going to sing a song, and then we're going to go back and we're going to learn a little bit about our God and how he loves us and some of the stories that his people have experienced. Let's sing a song. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus died for all the children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus died for all the children of the world. All right, little ones, I need you to stand up and walk to the back. Walk to those back doors. Go back that way. Go back that way. Be careful. No, wrong way, Roman. That way. <laughs> have fun. Have fun. Hey, adults, while they're on their way out, I have a children's message just for you. Okay? So we'll let them leave. And one of the best things that an adult did for me was speak that God had a plan for my life. And it's not enough for them just to hear it on Sundays. They need to hear that on replay every single day. As often as you can tell them about God's love, declare God's love out loud. Say it. God has a great plan for your life. Speak over them purpose. Because you are the minister of reconciliation for them. You're the one who brings the gospel to them. Do it every day. Let's continue to worship in song. Let's stand on up. Man, so if you guys looked around <laughs> at the start of our worship and saw how many seats were full, <laughs> I think our kids make up about half of us today. <laughs> Amen. So let's pray for our kids' volunteers. How about that, right? <laughs> All right, let's, let's worship our God together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He 
bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. T'will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Amen. <clears throat> we shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts into his presence. We bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, we sing the song of the redeemed. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts into his presence. We bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men, counselor, comforter, keeper. Spirit, we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost our way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own. Here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for 
Come on, church. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger can be seated. All right. Thank you, Dustin. Good morning, everybody. Hope you guys are doing well. He is right. It was such an interesting sight to see the exodus of kids uh, when it was time for them to go back. It was just like all flooded out. And so now we got these like big gaps. So I'm going to like pinpoint you guys as I'm preaching at you. Okay. So be ready for that. Um, today, I want to start out with a couple of, uh, a few announcements here, and then we'll jump into our lessons. So the first one is that this May, May the 20th, um, we are going to have a, an event uh, to use something that our dear brother Kenny made for us a long time ago and that we have not been able to use yet. Uh, it is a fire pit out here in the back. If you guys haven't seen it, Kenny built that for, uh, for us uh, himself. And on May the 20th, we want to have a bonfire, uh, which I believe that's a Saturday night, and just invite um, everyone who's able to come, you know, young, old, kids, not kids, whether you're a parent, single, married, whatever, we want you guys to come and just enjoy that time with family. So that is May the 20th. That's a Friday. Yeah, so I did that on purpose because you can sleep in on Saturday. Friday night, there we go. So May the 20th, uh, just mark that in your calendars. Um, we're going to just be having hot dogs, s'mores, and those types of things. If you want to contribute to that, uh, let me know or, or talk to Dustin. And we'll get that sorted out for a bonfire on the 20th. Then, as kind of some uh, children's ministry uh, type announcements, the next big uh, thing we're going to be doing for our kids is an Akron Zoo trip on June the 4th. Now, if that's not a Saturday, I intended it to be a Saturday. So it is the first Saturday in June. We're going to go to the Akron Zoo. We'll meet up here in the morning um, as, as families, and then we'll caravan to the zoo, have some uh, lunch together, go around, and, and uh, just have some fun with the animals. So that's going to be June the 4th. I will be giving more details on that in the weeks to come, but I wanted you to mark your calendars for that. Okay, that's June the 4th. And then I do have a tentative calendar of events um, just for children's ministry uh, stuff in general for the rest of the year. Um, so parents, expect me to be getting that out to you this week. Um, even if some of those dates and events change, I want you guys to have those on your calendars. Um, and also for our volunteers to have those on your calendars so that they're not going to be a surprise to you later on. Okay? So I'll be getting that to you guys this week. Um, also... Uh, and this is sort of changing the subject here a little bit. It's been a while since we've had an updated directory. It's been a little bit. And our dear brother Kenny and Joanne have uh, volunteered to update our directory for us. Um, so I believe it's the next two Sundays that we talked about. Yeah, so the first two Sundays in May, um, Joanne is going to be here and she's going to be willing to uh, take pictures of people. Uh, you know, if you want uh, to have your picture included in that directory. And she'll also have a very simple form for you guys to fill out, put as much contact information in there as you want. Um, and if uh, for some reason you can't make it in person or um, you know, can't be there those Sundays, let us know and we can like either send you the form so we can get the information, or you can send a picture in, we'll work it out. But those first two Sundays, Ken and Joanne will be working on that directory, which we're really thankful for you guys. Um, and I think that's all that I have for right now. Let's go ahead and say a prayer as we uh, get started this morning. Dear Lord, we are thankful for everything that you've given us. We're thankful for the sunshine and, and the warm weather, even though uh, to, to many it felt like whiplash <laughs> with the week that we've had. But Lord, we're so grateful that um, the winter uh, never lasts forever. That spring always comes, um, and that that speaks to how uh, your, your resurrection, the life that you yourself 
are that you contain that uh, will always be victorious. And so, Lord, we thank you for the signs that we see in creation and for the chance to glorify you um, uh, just in, in praising you for what you've done. We do want to pray over all those who are uh, just struggling for any reason right now. It could be health, it could be emotional trouble, financial trouble, spiritual trouble. Lord, we have many things that we're facing, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us through all those things. Give us the strength that we need to press on and, uh, Lord, to take steps walking ever closer to you. I pray that in this time for this message that you would please move me out of the way, help me to speak the words that are going to be helpful for all of us listening now or, or in the future online um, or even right now online, Lord, that um, our hearts would be opened, our minds would be attentive, and that with our hands we would put into practice the things that we're learning today. I thank you, Lord, for this message, um, and I pray that it would affect me just as much as it affects anybody else. Thank you so much for Jesus, and that it is in his name and in his resurrection that we have hope. We pray all this in his name. Amen. So last week, which uh, was Easter, by the way, in case you missed it, uh, <laughs> Easter was um, where Dustin started this new series um, called This Changes Everything, talking about how the resurrection of Jesus changes everything, right? It changes everything for the believer. It changes um, three specific things that Dustin brought up is that this fact that Jesus is alive, right? That the, the Romans and the chief priests and the scribes, they did not succeed in putting him to death permanently, right? He came back from the grave. That fact gives us hope beyond death, right? It gives us joy for this life and for the life to come, and it gives us access to life itself, right? There's so much that should change, that should have major implications for our lives but I don't know about you, but I don't always live that way. Maybe we don't always live that way. Sometimes our, our worship feels more dead than alive. Sometimes uh, we tend to live for ourselves instead of living for Christ. And, and maybe that we aren't experiencing joy or hope or life. And you may be thinking, okay, what gives? <laughs> you know, so if Jesus is alive, why aren't I experiencing these things? Why aren't I feeling different or looking different or, or doing differently. And so in this series, what we want to do is we're going to take the, um, so today and the next two Sundays, looking at three disciples in the book of Acts and sort of charting how the resurrection of Jesus changed their lives and changed them completely. And hopefully we'll be able to kind of examine why they were changed, how they were changed, and that will give us some insight into how we can be changed, and maybe some reasons for why we haven't made that transition yet, or maybe why it doesn't always feel constant. And so today, we're going to be talking about the Apostle Peter, um, who we know as Simon Peter, one of the 12 apostles, and we're going to chart kind of uh, a few of his stories in the Gospels, and then I want to transition to how he looks in the book of Acts, okay? So um, as we jump into this, what I want to look at first is Matthew chapter 14. I want to make sure I had my, my notes here correctly. So if we jump over to Matthew 14, what I'm going to do is, so let me, let me give you just a little bit of background for Peter in case, you know, maybe there's some details that we might have forgotten. Peter uh, was a fisherman, all right, named Simon. And, you know, he was kind of like your average Jewish boy. He grew up in Israel. He probably learned the law. He might have even gone to, uh, you know, the synagogue trying to see if maybe he could get into rabbi school, right? He could be a teacher of the law, but, you know, maybe his dad was a fisherman, so maybe he needed to take up the family business. Maybe his dad couldn't spare him becoming a teacher of the law, or maybe Peter didn't have the aptitude for it. But whatever reason, Peter ends up being a fisherman, right? So he works with his hands. You know, it's hard work every week, and probably wouldn't bring in fish all the time. In fact, there are several stories where he and his seasoned fisherman buddies are having trouble bringing fish in. Um, and so sometimes there's good money, other times worrying about how to feed the family, right? And so this is where Simon is kind of growing up. And then one day, 
uh, he hears from John the Baptist, this, this prophet, that he points to this guy named Jesus of Nazareth, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And so Peter's like, oh, this guy, he might be the Messiah, the one called Christ, which is these words that mean God's chosen one, who's going to become king of Israel, right? And who's going to defeat the Romans and who's going to free all of us from the oppression that we're under. He's going to make everything better for Israel. And so Peter is obviously very interested in who Jesus is. And surprisingly, when he goes to Jesus and asks, Rabbi, where are you staying? This is all coming from John 1, by the way. Jesus is said, hey, he said, come and see. And later in all the other Gospels, we see an invitation for Peter to follow after Jesus. And what's interesting in John chapter 1 is that, so his name is Simon first, right? When Simon comes uh, to Jesus and Jesus says, follow me. In John 1, it says that when Jesus met him, he said, you are Simon, but I will call you Cephas. Which is a word in Aramaic that means rock which is the same thing that Peter means in the Greek. And so instead of calling him Simon, he calls him a rock or, or rocky. All right, not, not like the, you know, that rocky, but yeah, <laughs> that he would be stable, maybe, that he would be reliable. He was calling him to something different. Well, so taking all of that into account and remembering that as Peter is following Jesus, he's seeing Jesus work all these different miracles. He's preaching these like amazing sermons, giving authority that no one else had. And then we get to Matthew chapter 14. This is right after Jesus feeds the 5,000. And Jesus is on a mountain. He's praying. He's away from the disciples. And he sends them on ahead of him. They get into the boat and, and they start rowing across the Sea of Galilee, but this just huge storm overtakes them. And it's probably like one of the biggest storms they've ever faced. And for them, a lot of them being fishermen, that would be a scary thing. And so they're rowing and they're struggling and they're trying to sail and they're just not making very good headway until late in the night, they see a figure coming out to them, but this figure is walking on the water. And so they think, oh, this, is a, this is a ghost, and right? And they're scared, but Jesus calls out and he says, don't be afraid, it's, it's me. And so he's walking out to them. And then Peter, as we'll learn in his character, Peter likes to speak first, okay? Peter likes to uh, be the one to say something, to do something first. He's a little bit impulsive in that way. And so he sees Jesus and he says, Lord, if it's you, in fact, here, let's, let's jump into, the, into the, the verses here and I'll, I'll read it here in Matthew 14, verse 28. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, and he came to Jesus. And let, let's just take a second to understand what just happened. Like, they, Peter didn't know walking on the water was even a thing until he sees Jesus doing it, right? And so then Peter, looking at Jesus, somehow has the faith in Jesus' power to say, oh, well, if he can do that, he can make me walk on the water too. Like, this is an amazing point of belief for Peter because he actually does it. He actually walks on the water, you know, in, in the, 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 the tossing waves and I don't know how tall they would have been, but with the wind and the, and the rain and all that stuff, he was able to walk on the water. But then we, we read on, we know the rest of the story in verse 30. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So what we see here is characteristic of Peter's whole time following Jesus. He has this great moment of faith. You might call it like a mountaintop moment. And he's there, he's believing in Jesus, he's out on the water, and then he takes his eyes off Jesus, looks at the wind. It's like he almost remembers like, oh yeah, there's a storm going on. And, and he's afraid. He's terrified, and he, and he begins to sink. He loses faith in Jesus, and the power of the storm seems stronger than the power of the one he was looking at. And so we see Peter go like this, and then right back down, just 
literally. He was going underneath the water, right? And this is his, it's kind of his story. All right, I, I don't have time to go through all of his stories, but we look at the confession of Christ, how Jesus asks Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter's like, you're, you're the Christ. You're the chosen one of God, the son of the living God. So he gets it. He knows who Jesus is, and Jesus praises him for that. He says, you, know, you are Peter. You are this, this rock. Blessed are you because the Heavenly Father has shown you this. And then in like the next paragraph, Jesus tells them that he's going to die. He's going to go to the cross, he's, but he's going to be raised back to life. And Peter must not have heard that last part because he comes to Jesus. He's like, no, no, Lord, you can't die. You know, the Christ doesn't die. The King of Israel doesn't die. And Jesus rebukes him. He calls him Satan. He says, get behind me, Satan, right? And so Peter goes up and then back down. We see this in the transfiguration where Jesus is on the mountain and he's showing and, and just divine glory. They see the glory of the Father in Jesus and he's talking with Moses and Elijah. And Peter's like, wow. You know, it was Peter, James, and John who were allowed to be there with Jesus. And Peter looks at all this and then said these profound words. Lord, it's good that we're here. Because now we can make you some tents, one for you and Moses and Elijah. And then the voice of God the Father calls down from heaven and he says, This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And I don't know what Peter was trying to accomplish, but he was just like, Man, it's a good thing we're here, Jesus. Man, what, what kind of state would you have been in if we weren't here? Better make you some shelters. I don't, maybe he's just saying anything. But you know, he's on this mount, literal mountaintop with Jesus, and then he gets, he gets rebuked. And so we just see this over and over again. And this really culminates in the story of the crucifixion, where if we jump on over to Matthew 26. And we start here in verse 31. Uh, then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. He's predicting to them what's going to happen when he's arrested, right? They're going to be scared. They're going to run away. And he goes on to say, For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee, right? Still giving that hope of the resurrection. But then Peter answers him, Though all will fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. But Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same, right? Not just Peter. But again, what's interesting here is that I don't know that Peter was insincere, right? I think he probably meant what he said. Like, Lord, I'm not going to fall away. Even if I have to die with you, other version or other gospels say, if I have to go to prison or to death, I am with you all the way. I think Peter probably at least wanted to believe that. You know, he made this grand promise, but then Jesus says, you're not going to keep it. Before the rooster crows, you know, so within this nighttime, you're going to deny me three times. And then, of course, I'm actually going to skip Gospels. I'm going to jump over to Luke chapter 22. We see that very thing. After G uh, Peter has denied Jesus two times already, for fear of the servants, like they seem to recognize, oh, you were with Jesus, or your accent sounds like you, you came from where Jesus lived, and he's like, no, I don't know the man. I don't know what you're talking about. And then in 60, we get the third denial, verse 60. Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord. How he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter goes out, and he weeps bitterly. Man, can you imagine being in Peter's place? Knowing, remembering exactly what Jesus said after you've already done it, and then looking at him? Oh, how much shame must Peter have felt in that moment? How much disgust with himself? 
Like he, he didn't just betray his Lord and his master, he betrayed his friend. And, and the tough thing about this, I was going to save this point till later, but I, I think it, it fits right now, is that Peter's story is my story. Right? Maybe, maybe it's our story. We make these grand promises to God or these sincere confessions of faith. Maybe we even act on our faith every now and then. And I, I feel sincere, right? I feel like I'm actually following Jesus, but then when the pressure's on, when there's something to be afraid of, when my trust in Jesus comes against trust in myself, you know, and I think I can handle it, or when my love for Jesus comes in conflict with the love for myself, then I, too, deny Jesus. Maybe not like Peter did, but with my actions, with my words, yeah. In my heart, yeah. You know, I don't know if I necessarily have a fear of, of death because I follow Jesus. In America, we don't really have that type of persecution, but I know if someone, you know, just even seems the slightest bit hostile, or like, oh, maybe they're just not even interested, or maybe I even put words in their mouth like, oh, they don't want to hear about Jesus, then I'm, I'm pretty quick to not talk about him or not, not live like him, not live like he's alive. My courage goes away because I'm afraid of man, people's opinion. Or, like I said, I, I trust in myself. I, I love myself, and, and you know, I, I'm fooled into thinking I can handle whatever's going on or that I need to protect myself and I don't live for Jesus. However, that's not where Peter's story ends. That's not where our story ends either. If we go over to uh, John chapter 21, I'll, I'll try to move quickly through this. Jesus has already showed himself to the disciples at least once here in John's account. And in chapter 21, we find just this really interesting thing where um, Simon Peter, he talks to the other apostles. He's like, I'm going fishing. And the disciples are like, okay, yeah, we'll go with you. And at first, that might seem kind of innocent, kind of innocuous. But if you think about it, Jesus called Peter from being a normal fisherman to become a fisher of men. He gave him a new role, a new identity, a new purpose. And even after the resurrection, Peter just kind of goes back to what he was doing before. Maybe what was comfortable, what he knows he can do. And then the ironic thing is they don't catch anything all night, right? They're fishing all night and they can't catch anything. And Jesus shows up. He says, cast your, night, your net on this side of the boat. And they catch a just ginormous catch of fish, right? Mirroring Jesus' uh, other miracles he's done with the fishermen before. And so they're like, oh, it's the Lord. And Peter jumps out of the boat and he swims to Jesus. He doesn't even wait for the other guys. And it's in true Peter fashion, right? And then when they all get together and they're, they're having breakfast and they're eating fish, Jesus starts talking to Peter and here in verse 15. So when they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep, he said. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I think it's, it's worth noting that Jesus asks this question three times, mirroring the three denials that Peter gave right? And it's interesting because I, I hear this as a passage like, oh, Jesus reinstates Peter and, and all is forgiven. I believe all is forgiven, right? I mean, Jesus still died for him. Peter is still part of the apostles. He's still part of the fold. But have you ever had a time where you've hurt somebody and they've definitely forgiven you, but you know there's still some work to be done, like to build up trust again? You know, like they've forgiven you, but there's, there's still a little bit of consequences. There's still some distance that we need to work through. 
I think this is what Jesus is doing to Peter, and Peter is grieved because he knows that what he's done, it's, it's making Jesus question the love that Peter has for him. Even the first question is telling, Simon, do you love me more than these? I don't know who the these are that he's referring to. Maybe it's the other apostles. Maybe it's the fish. Maybe it's just his life. Do you love me more than everything else? And so Jesus is, again, this, you know, this up and down that Peter's doing. He's saying, come back. All right, if you love me, take care of my sheep. Take care of the disciples. Because we see after Jesus goes back to heaven, he gives them instructions on how to make disciples. What do we see in the book of Acts? We see Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, give a very authoritative and, and persuasive and, and passionate sermon saying, look guys, we were the ones that put Jesus to death. You know, the guilt is on our heads and all the people are they're cut to the heart and they're like, what are we going to do? And, and Peter says, repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. And thousands, right, are baptized that day. That seems like kind of a different Peter than the impulsive, open mouth, insert foot kind of, kind of guy we're used to, right? But then we also see in Acts chapter 5, in Acts chapter 5, Peter and John are taken captive by the chief priests and the scribes because they're preaching about Jesus and they're healing people. And the chief priests and scribes don't like that because they put Jesus to death, right? And so they're saying, stop talking about Jesus. In verse 27, it says, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Trying to make us guilty for Jesus? No. Nah. No, we're not guilty for Jesus. And then Peter and the rest of the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed, by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And then I think this next verse is so interesting. When they heard this, the council, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. So here was Peter denying Jesus, right? Jesus had to say, hey, do you really love me? And he was calling him back to that. And Peter was afraid of death. He Basically, he, he became a coward, right? He, he didn't believe in Jesus or in his power or in what he said about the resurrection. And so he denied him three times. And then this is a completely different Peter, guys, right? He's, not only is he preaching and preaching boldly like, hey, you, you killed this man. You were the ones who hung him on a tree. But he's even willing to face their anger, their rage, and wanting to kill them. Like, that, that's a different type of faith, guys. That's a different type of courage, of trust, of love. Now, the rest of the story goes on to say how um, the council actually talks about it more, and they, they don't put them to death, but they still beat them up, and they, uh, Peter and the rest of the guys, they go away rejoicing that they were able to suffer in the name of Jesus. And so what, what do we see here? What changed Peter so completely? And so I want to look at a couple things for why Peter changed. The first reason we could stop here is the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit working through, Je uh, through Peter to make him the way that he was. We were talking in the Sermon on the Mount a lot about how the condition of our hearts is what needs to be changed. It's the Holy Spirit that does that kind of change in us. When we ask him to work on us, when we pray for that, and when we submit ourselves to his will, he's going to produce that kind of fruit, that fruit of the spirit that Jesus is looking for. And so that's where we could stop. But the next thing I think is worth noting that what Peter believed about what Jesus said changed. His belief in what Jesus said changed. First, he believed in what Jesus said about himself. Right? He saw the resurrection with his own eyes. He saw the power that Jesus had over death, over wind and the waves, over everything that Peter was afraid of, over everything that made Peter stumble, Jesus had power over. He was in control of. In fact, 
if Jesus is the son of God, think about what that would mean for Peter and for the rest. And what it means for us. That Jesus created the whole world, guys. That he, he made the heavens and the earth and yet he came to become a, a person living among us, willing to die for us. So like the kind of love that shows is amazing in and of itself, but then the fact that he came back to life? What, what more do we have to fear at that point? Right? The God who created everything loves me, has forgiven me, has given me chance for new life. Well, what more is there to fear? What else is there to love besides God? Why would I love myself more than him? Loving myself is what got me into all the trouble and the sins that I become tangled up in. Trusting myself instead of trusting God doesn't make sense because he knows everything. He knows the right way. He knows how to use my schedule. He knows how to uh, uh, use my talents and my, and my time and, and how to provide for my family. And then Peter also believed what Jesus said about himself. Peter believed that what Jesus said about him, that he was going to be a rock, stable, firm, reliable, courageous. That's who Jesus was saying, that's, that's who you are, Peter. No longer are you just Simon, but you are Peter. And that's what we see show up in Acts. He shows up as this stable, reliable leader because of what Jesus is doing in him, and he believed it. He believed, and in fact, this is why he can say in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, First Peter 1, verse 3, where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter understood that, hey, we are born again to the family of God. Our hope in Jesus is not just that he died, but that he is alive, and that he is powerful, that he has power over everything and, and anything. And so this, this changes Peter. So what did Peter learn? Peter learned to have courage instead of fear, to trust in Jesus instead of trusting in himself, and to have love for Jesus instead of love for self. In fact, to love Jesus above all other things. Peter learned that when that was true of him, he could be the man that Jesus called him to be. That was the work that Jesus did, not just Peter. And so my question for us maybe is, I guess a couple questions. The first one is, um, what do we need to learn from this? What do we need to learn from this? Do I need to learn to not fear man and, and, and death and sickness and all, all those sorts of things because God has it? Because God's in control? Because no matter what happens, he has the outcome in his hands? Do I need to learn how to trust him with everything that I have because he's a better manager than I ever will be? Right? And he knows the end from the beginning. Do I learn, do I need to learn how to love him more than myself? more than the things of, of this earth that entangle me and, and entrap me. And then my last question for us is, why aren't we living like Jesus? Or why aren't we living like Jesus is alive? What would it take to live like Jesus is alive to make this dramatic change that Peter made? And I think it starts with asking, what don't I believe about Jesus? like really actually believe, or about myself. Maybe I believe that Jesus is Lord, but uh, Lord over my stuff? Or I believe Jesus is Savior, but oh man, over my sin? Uh, my sin is, is pretty big, but no, he is Lord over everything. So what I want you guys to do, all of us to do, take this question this week. Why aren't I living like Jesus is alive? Think on that, pray on that. And share what you think with someone else this week. Talk about it. And see, hey, if, if Peter, if Peter can have this dramatic transformation, can't I? Can't we all be changed like the Holy Spirit changed Peter? And if we don't believe that, 
we don't believe in our risen Lord because he has the power. Let's, let's stand together and let's sing about who he is. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me, who caused his pain, for me who scorned his perfect love. Oh, amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Oh, amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? You left your Father's throne above, so free and infinite your grace. Emptied yourself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Oh, amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Oh, amazing love, how can it be that you, my God would die for me. Boldly I come before your throne to claim your mercy immense and free. No greater love could e'er be known for, oh, my God, it found out me. Oh, amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Oh, amazing love, how can it be that you, my God would die for me. You guys can be seated for communion. Good morning, church family. How's everybody doing today? I'm doing well. Does anybody need one of these little communion cups before we get too far here? Just raise your hand if you need one. Got one over here. Corey's going to bring him around. Oh, false alarm. All right, everyone's got one. Cool. So a common theme in my life as of late is being stuck. Um, in my son's words, it's, I'm guck. My son has this phrase that when he's playing with me, when he's getting punished, uh, when he's actually stuck, he goes into panic mode and just starts going, I'm guck! Help me! I'm guck! Loses his mind. And the theme continued yesterday, because I already started thinking about this, having communion and this, this theme of, I'm guck, I'm guck. And yesterday, David and I thought it would be a great idea and a great experience for Jace to start clearing out a campsite out back. And my dad told me, Aaron, it's pretty wet out. I said, pfft. I got four-wheel drive. It's 80 degrees all day long. Okay, Dad. I took the truck out back. I got stuck. <laughs> and Jace, as we're sitting there and the tires are turning, I hear him go, um, guys? Are we stuck? And we said, yeah, Jace, you're about to learn something today. <laughs> And this phrase is in my mind, I'm guck, I'm guck. Leading up to communion, I've thought about so many times in my faith where I've been guck, where I've been stuck. 
And there's been so many times that because I've had this idea that, okay, I see the risk here, but I think I'm willing to take it. So I do that thing that's just towing that line, and then I find myself stuck. And there's repercussions that come from that. How many of you have been stuck in your faith? I am so glad that I don't have to stay stuck in my faith because of what Jesus Christ did for me. In my life, I've been stuck because of my horrible decisions, but because of Christ, I have been set free. I don't have to stay there. He has released me, and he has redeemed me because of what his son did for me on the cross. In Romans 6, verses 1 through 7, it says, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Yes. That's not what it says. Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been, been united with him in his death. We will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. We don't have to be guck. We have been set free because of what Jesus did for us. Let's go to God in prayer and remember what uh, the sacrifice Christ did on the cross for us. God, I am so thankful that you sent your son for me. God, there is no way that I'm worthy of that. And the fact that you showed your son for each and every one of us and gave him to, to die on the cross, to be a sacrifice, to be humiliated, so I don't have to stay humiliated in my sin, is just amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for Jesus. It's in your son's precious holy name. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer again for the fruit of the vine. Dear God, thank you so much for the blood, blood that was shed on the cross. Uh, Father, it's such a gruesome scene. And it amazes me that such a gruesome scene can lead to such a beautiful reality and being saved by your son and being washed by his blood. Thank you so much. In your son's precious name, amen. We also have time to give. Uh, there's a box in the back where you can give online. Lately, I've been really working with Zakai that any time that he gets money, he puts it in this little jar for his college fund. And it used to be we'd pull out the college fund jar, and he'd just start reaching in and just starts chucking change around the room. Like, and then we'd find it, and the one time he's sitting there going, I said, Zakai, what's in your mouth? He goes, Bleh. And a quarter falls out. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. I'm a horrible parent. Thank God for forgiveness. Okay. And now he's got to the point where any time that he's getting change or he gets dollar bills, he runs with me. He goes, Dad, come on, Dad. Come on, Dad. Come on, Dad. Runs to his room and points up to his college change jar. We throw money in there. He's gotten excited about it. And it was a reality check for me as I'm reflecting this week because I thought there was not often – Many times in my life where I'm running to the offering plate right now. I don't look forward to running towards this moment because I'm selfish. Got a lot of bills piling, medical bills. We got a baby on the way. My saving mind comes into play. And I become really selfish with what God gave me. And that's not right. And I need to check myself in this moment to remember that God's given me all of this. Without him, none of this is possible. My son running and saying he's guck and putting into his change jar that blessing, the blessing of being here together, none of this happens without Jesus. And so I owe him everything. And this, a piece of leather with some paper in it, does not compare to what he has given to me. So maybe you need to reflect and check yourself this morning. Make sure your heart's right. Maybe you're excited, and that's awesome. But let's reflect on that moment as we pray, as we give. God, thank you so much uh, for all the many blessings.
most of all your son. God, I know that as physical beings, we cling to physical things, but Father, you've called us to a different life. We have been, uh, our, our flesh has been crucified, so we pray that that part of us can die and the spirit within us can live and we can connect with you through our giving, that we can make an impact in this community, that we can create uh, the space here to continue on for uh, our congregation here and those who may join us. God, we love you. Thank you for Jesus and your son's precious holy name. Amen. So um, we are about to sing a song uh, before our closing prayer, which Sam has today. Sam's number is 614-601-1598. So if you want to stay seated uh, for this portion, you can do that and just text Sam your prayer requests. If, however, uh, something from today's service pricked you, moved you, and wanted you or or you feel like you want to respond, uh, we're going to offer an invitation uh, during this song for you to come up, for you to find a seat here in the front row, um, and you'll be prayed over in this moment uh, as uh, you're going to be received up here, but then you'll also, uh, we're going to pray over you at the close of our service as well. So if you are moved to come forward, you may do so. Uh, if you want to stay in your seat and send a text message, that's okay too. Uh, but you have the opportunity to do that as we sing this song. So go ahead and stand, and let's sing together. <clears throat> all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. To Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender Okay, so a few prayer requests that uh, came in this morning. Um, the first one was a prayer request from Kenny, um, a 11-year-old uh, boy in uh, Reagan's class was uh, stabbed to death by his 18-year-old brother. Um, so we want to keep that family in our prayers. We want to... Um, 
his brother is, is in prison now. And so, you know, prayers to that whole situation. I believe you went to school with uh, their mother, Ken. So um, just, you know, praying for, for friends and, and just everyone this is going to affect. Um, again, one of those things where the gospel is good news, and, but it's also hard to deal with the brokenness of the world. And so giving the gospel to people in times like this is so, so important. And so even prayers that we would respond in times like this with the gospel, I think, is, is important. We want to pray for uh, Tim Simmons um, or Poppy, as Cash has, uh, has texted, for him to get better and healthier. We, we do praise God that there is a treatment plan in place and that he's walking those steps, um, but it's going to be a, a long road. And so praying for him and his strength uh, and just for the whole family as they work through this. Uh, we also want to pray for Catherine, um, uh, Dustin's wife. She just was not feeling very well. Um, it might be a, a Crohn's flare-up, and so we just want to pray for her to get better, um, for her to feel a lot stronger so that she can be with us again. And in all things, um, let's pray that we are there for each other, for our brothers and sisters, and for those who we know outside the body who just need help and need prayers. So let's lift all that up today. Lord, as we come before you, um, Lord, I know that uh, just some of the prayer requests that, that we've thought of, that, Lord, there are still things that are heavy in this life, that are tragic, and sometimes it is hard to, to remember your goodness, and it's hard to remember your love and your power, um, your ability to have control over all these situations, and that you are sovereign. I pray, Lord, that you would please remind us of these things as we pray, um, and as we go about our lives, that, um, Lord, you do have a plan for us. And Jesus is, is the working out of that plan, that death is not the end, and that, Lord, lives even here and now can be transformed by your Holy Spirit. Lord, let us be messengers of that, ministers of that uh, type of transformation and hope after death um, to all those around us, and that you truly can heal everything, physical um, or spiritual. I pray that you'd please be uh, with this this 11-year-old boy in, in Regan's class and just the, oh man, the, the ripples that um, are, are going to to affect all of those around him um, at, at his his tragic passing. Lord, the, the ripples through his family, through his class and, and friends, and Lord, I just pray that you would be with that family. Lord, give them... Uh, in a way only you can, give them peace and comfort, give them strength, help them to rely on you, because Lord, relying on anything else um, will will just do more harm to them. So Lord, please help them to find you in all of this, and I pray that you would be with this 18-year-old boy, and and what, what things that he, the brokenness that he is carrying, that he is perpetuating, that Lord, you would change him that you'd be with him, um, and Lord, show him a better way. I just pray for uh, comfort and peace for all those who are affected by, uh, by this, boy's, uh, this boy's passing. I pray you'll please be with Tim and with um, the, the healing that he is going through. Lord, we are thankful that you've given a treatment plan and you've given some answers, and Lord, I pray you would give him strength to walk this path, that you would be with him, help his, his body to respond well, and that he would be healed, that he would become stronger because of all of this um, through this process that will will definitely test him. Be with the whole family and just give them peace and comfort. Give them strength as they work through all of this, and we thank you that your hand is with them all. Uh, Please continue to be with Catherine and her dealing with Crohn's, that you would just bring her through this this flare-up and through um, this pain, and that you would heal her um, so that she can get back to doing what, uh, uh, what you set for her to do. Lord, again, we are thankful for the hope of the resurrection, for the hope of life after death, and for that living hope that we have in you, Jesus, because you are alive. Help us to live like it. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. We do have life group, so stay if you want some delicious food. All right. Thanks, guys.